welcome everybody. Uh, thanks for coming out. Um, I'm Adam Glazier. I'm a UX designer on Google Earth VR and on other VR and AR apps at Google. And um, so me and my colleagues uh, worked on Earth VR for the past few years, and we're going to share a little bit about some of the UX um, struggles and solutions that we went through to get there. Um, but before I do, I'm going to share just uh, just some brief background on Google Earth. So as you know, about 14 years ago, Google started exploring the idea of mapping the entire Earth. Um, and uh, we started out with satellite data, but then we started using planes and cars to collect imagery, more imagery data. And using that, we used photogrammetry to slowly build um, a more complex 3D mesh of the entire Earth. Uh, we, we, we released this on desktop and mobile, and um, you know this was fine, but really the medium needed to be unlocked like you're there. And VR is the first time that we were actually to, able to experience this data in the way it was meant to be, um, which was really fantastic. But in order to do that, um, getting this to run at 90 FPS, at rendering the entire Earth 10 milliseconds every frame, uh, was extraordinarily difficult uh, using the existing code base. Um, so to do this, um, just consider the fact that like in your average city is millions of triangles. And as you zoom out, you exponentially start to grow that till eventually the entire planet, you're looking at millions of, or trillions and trillions of triangles. On top of that, we do um, atmospheric shading, atmospheric scattering, realistic time of day simulations. And so we need to render all of these things um, in such a, a short amount of time with no dropped frames. Um, so to do this, we needed to improve on the architecture of the, uh, the existing experience by, we started with frustum calling, uh, draw call batching, and a bunch of other ways to eliminate the bottlenecks caused by the existing pipeline. Now, last year, before we released Google Earth VR, we talked about this at SIGGRAPH. So if you're interested in the rendering optimizations and ways that you can render entire planet, uh, go back and watch that talk. We give some, some insights there. So the first thing we did when we got a prototype Vive, we were one of the first companies to get the Vive uh, with the Tag Room demo. Uh, we put people in this, like, our founders, Larry and Sergey Brin and uh, JJ Abrams. And immediately they wanted to go further than the, the limit of the three meter by three meter room. They wanted to go down the street or over the mountain and really explore around. So to give you some context at this time, this was about two years ago. We had a prototype Vive. There were a few demos. Uh, but no great examples of even just how to get um, short distances. So we essentially had no idea what we were doing. Um, so we did the first thing we thought of, which was allow the user to point somewhere, and wherever their ray intersects, we'll teleport them there instantly. Um, this was really convenient, because you could get to the top of a mountain instantly. But if you've ever tried this um, with large distances, like it works well in small spaces when you're going sp small distances, but if you go to the top of a mountain, users would get there and look around and then look down and realize, oh, they're on top of the mountain. So, you know, it, it's, a, it's a good idea in theory, but in practice, it didn't actually work. Um, and this was fine, um, but users also wanted a higher view or a lower view. So we gave them the ability to scale themselves by clicking up and down on the touchpad. They could grow and shrink themselves. Um, and they got those views they desired, but um, there was a problem that came up is they would teleport towards a building or a mountain, and then they would say, oh, I want to see what this is like at human scale. So they'd scale themselves down, and as they did that, something unexpected happened, which is that building or mountain starts to drift further and further away. So that thing that was just two meters in front of them also all of a sudden goes way outside the room. So you'd end up with this clunky, teleport, scale, 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 teleport, scale, 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 just to get at human scale in front of a door or at the base of a mountain. So 
uh, to make up for the loss of context with teleport, we tried step teleporting by just incrementally getting the user closer. And this worked okay, but it felt a little clunky and it broke immersion because every time you jump to a new place, it just feels artificial. Um, and, and then as you can see, on the way to the top of the mountain, the person ends up with their feet not on the ground. So if they stop or look down on the way, a lot of people end up feeling disorient or sorry, um, discomfort or have the fear of heights. So to make up for the fear of heights, we just kept their head in the same place and scaled themselves so that their feet were always on the ground. And at the time, this was just a crazy experiment. We thought people would get really sick if we just scale them and up and down as they're going. But it actually worked really well. Um, so then we tried another thing that we knew we weren't supposed to do, which is like flying the user. Um, so instead of the stepped motion, it's continuous motion. And we keep their feet on the ground during this. Um, and this worked the best for preserving immersion. So people didn't lose context on the way to where they were going. Whenever they stopped, their feet were on the ground. Uh, but there was one big problem, which is it made 95% of the people sick um, because what they see and what their body feels doesn't match. So we had this problem. Flying was awesome in all these ways, but it made basically everyone feel sick. And teleport was convenient, but you lose context and you break immersion. So we wanted to be somewhere in the middle. We wanted total immersion, it easy to use, there's no context loss, and no nausea. So we came up with a really cool trick to solve this, which we call tunnel vision. So as you can see in this video, about halfway through, in the outer edges of the user's view, we project a grid on the floor and a horizon line. So what this does is it's similar to the effect of being in a living room or a theater where the stuff on the TV is moving, but your living room is not. And it's that outer area that tells your body, OK, this is OK, I'm not moving. It's just the stuff on this screen. But it turns out you don't need a rug and a couch, and you don't need it to be an entire room. You actually only need about 15% of the user's field of view. Um, instead of a rug, you can just project a high contrast grid on the floor. And it turns out the horizon line is also a really important factor to help provide the users with balance. So with tunnel vision and scaled flying, we got somewhere close to the middle of our goal. We lose a little bit of immersion because some people notice the tunnel vision. Um, but we feel like this is a good combination and it, um, it's worth it. Now when people fly really, really high into the atmosphere, uh, another problem emerged, which is people will look down and they would get tired of looking down at the Earth and trying to find what country they're on. And if the Earth wasn't rotated perfectly north, they would just be completely lost. Um, so we allow users to put the Earth in front of them and always keep north up. And then we project a, f a transparent floor under them so they don't feel like they're floating in space. Once we did this, users immediately wanted to grab the Earth and, and zoom in and out. So we use the same flying mechanism to enlarge the Earth or shrink it. And we always keep the surface of the Earth at the same distance. Um, so as it grows, it doesn't engulf them. Um, and to solve dragging, what we did was we put a proxy sphere on the Earth, where the sphere is the size of the Earth's crust. And wherever their ray is intersecting, we make sure that as they move their controller, that intersection point of the proxy sphere tracks with their ray. And then we update the Earth's rotation to match that proxy sphere. But when the user's standing on the Earth, now that proxy sphere is the size of the Earth. It's huge. And when the user's intersection point is on the ground and they're dragging the Earth, um, this works well. However, if the user points above themselves, now the proxy sphere is above them, but they end up dragging themselves into mountains and buildings. Uh, and for some reason, people don't like that. So we came up with this cool trick, which is a proxy cone. And we call this cone drag. So the way it works is 
on the proxy cone, the tip of it's at the base of the user's foot, and the base of the cone is where the user's ray intersected uh, the Earth's geometry. And by doing this, it means that that intersection point now just runs along a cone. And uh, this works really well. Users almost never end up going into geometry like a mountain or a building. So you can do really cool things like this with it. You can hop from the tops of buildings. Um, it just feels really effortless to get around. So I just shared a bunch of things, but if you're going to take four things away, um, we felt like scaled flying worked the best. Um, scaling meaning scaling the user, keeping their feet on the ground, and smooth movement. But that only worked really well if you couple that with tunnel vision. About 5% of our users can turn tunnel vision off um, and not feel sick, but um, the rest need it. And um, if you're going to do dragging at different elevations, cone drag is the way to go. And um, putting the globe in front of users is really important for them to get around. Um, so once we got all these things implemented, you know, it, it, it technically worked, um, but it didn't feel as great as we wanted. And so to get the feel right, I'm going to introduce Pear to talk about that. Thank you, Adam. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is uh, Per Carlson. I'm an engineer on the team. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the work we did once we had performance rendering in place and the um, the navigation methods kind of figure out. Because honestly, uh, once we were there, we thought we were very close to being done. And we were a little bit surprised when we showed it to test users. And they didn't have more of an emotional response. Uh, we would get feedback such as it feels artificial, it's dead, it's silent. Uh, and I'm going to cover what we did uh, to improve two of our most popular navigation methods, drag and flying and then briefly mention a little bit what we did with um, background sound. First off, so we started off by implementing drag very similar to regular Google Maps, regular Google Earth. We shoot a ray from the controller and we get an intersection point. Uh, and this is kind of some sort of direct manipulation. It moves one to one with how you move it. And this, this felt pretty good when, uh, when the planet is very small in front of you. But in cases when the planet was below you, and you were at a pretty low uh, scale, very small movement would move the planet. It was almost like the planet doesn't have any weight at all. And we want to create this like, immersive feeling of like, we want to simulate that the planet should be very heavy. It should be something that you can relate to. We also identified that just by like, starting this dragging gesture by pressing the trigger button, it was very hard to do so without moving the hand just a little bit. And depending on where you're pointing, this could cause uh, this like nasty jittering effect, um, which is very unpleasant. And it just once again, it just kind of ruined the immersion a little bit. There's no sort of weight. So what could we do to improve this? The first thing we tried was distance-based smoothing. We recognized that the further away you're pointing, the more sensitive it gets uh, for very small uh, changes in the controller. And we came up with a, a scheme that would do much more aggressive smoothing the further away this intersection point you would get uh, was. And this was great for reducing that jitter effect that we saw, but it didn't really help like making the planet feel heavier. Like when still when you were dragging right below you, it was reacting a little bit too much. So we went back to the drawing board and we thought in real life, if you have a really heavy object in front of you, and you push it, it's not going to move until you have given it enough force. And that is because you have static friction fighting back. And we thought, maybe we can simulate the interaction points using some physics-based mo physics -based model. Uh, and we'd end up choosing uh, a spring, because then it would be very trivial to try static friction. And then we can switch into kinetic friction once we pass a certain threshold. And we can choose damping ratios, so we'd get rid of uh, overshoots from, uh, from the spring. And the cool thing about this was, like now when you started a dragging gesture and you just moved the controller just a little bit, nothing would move. It was, it was fighting back. The problem with this method was that it was, how do you pick your spring parameters? Like, as Adam was talking about earlier, we have this scaled flying method. Like, we can constantly leave the user in a different scale at any time. 
how do we come up with such a parameters that it works in any scenario, like high, high scale, low scale, you're pointing far, you're pointing low, and it got really complicated, and it, it didn't really feel like, it was a little bit, uh, we were a little bit nervous that like there would be cases where did, this would not work, work out at all, so we realized we probably gonna end up need something that's more robust, even though like this showed great promise. And the thing that worked the best for us was using filtering. So in this, in the next slide that's coming up, um, you remember there was we're shooting a ray from the controller. So imagine that is the um, the red uh, ray coming out here, and then we take this through a filter and we get a blue ray. So there's gonna be some difference between the red and the blue. Um, and uh, so it's basically like we are applying the filtering. You can think of it as in you're applying f filtering on the controller, which means position and rotation. And this also means that these two rays, they're not guaranteed to like start from the same position. They can have completely different orientation. Um, anyway, so the, the filtering we chose was low pass filtering. And we have two different low pass, uh, two, two different filters. We have a very strong low pass filter and a much weaker one. And when you start the dragging gesture, right in the beginning, then we apply this super strong low pass filter. So you basically get almost no movement at all to simulate this static friction effect we had earlier. And the further away you get from the initial position or initial rotation, then we're starting to apply more of the, the loose low pass filter, which introduced this like nice uh, like lagging effect that the spring gave us earlier. And now what's good about this is it's working on the controller, we guarantee that it's gonna work in any scale, in any scenario, because the controller in relative motion to you is gonna be pretty much the same. This introduced a different problem. Like now we're doing intersection with this ray that is not even guaranteed to be attached to a controller anymore. What are we displaying to the user to communicate this? Should we show the post filter ray that's like disconnected? Probably not, that would feel weird. Uh, we ended up settling for an approach where we take the intersection of the post filter ray, we project it to the pre-filter ray. This ends up creating us a really nice hull, and we can use this hull to place control points in a cubic bezier. And then we always guarantee to have a very smooth rendering curve at any time. And just to make this look a little bit more nice, we fade out the opacity towards the end of the curve, because otherwise you end up with this awkward, thin, spaghetti-looking thing that's like acts as a link between you and the planet, so. That worked pretty well. Uh, we also wanted to simulate uh, some sort of resistance, like, okay, it's not moving now, like, if we introduce like, static friction and lag, like, the planet's fighting back, like, we wanna, we wanna simulate resistance. In real life, if you, let's say you attach, like, a rope to a heavy, heavy object and you pull this rope, it's, you're gonna feel this resistance, and we thought, of, we thought that we could use um, the haptics of the controller to, like, achieve something similar to this. So what we do, we, for two sequential frames, we take this, po the, this intersection point of the post filter rays, and then we compute the delta angle between these two points and the head. And this gives us a very nice, like one scalar uh, value that we can feed into the strength of the haptics. And we can use the same nice value to um, be the input for the, our sound system. So for the drag effect uh, in Earth VR, we ended up uh, making a slow dragging sound and a fast dragging sound. And then based on this value, like, it became very easy to just like, blend between them depending on this delta angle value. So just to demonstrate, the red lace you see here, this is like a debug render we had. Like, the more aggressive you drag, you see that the delta between these two becomes bigger. And then when you stop moving, the, it will always catch up in the end. And if you remember the previous slide when uh, the drag was reacting like very like one to one. It was very artificial. Like I think this demonstrates like now it feels more like natural. It's it still kind of does what you want it to do, but um, it feels a little bit more like we added weight. Secondly, I want to cover flight speed. So we realize like scale flying is probably the method that people like using the most. And the question is like, what kind of flight speed are we gonna choose? Because we are constantly changing the scale. And many of you in here probably heard like, we're in the VR space, it's, we heard many times that doing acceleration in VR can lead to motion sickness, and we should avoid it as much as we can. So the first thing we tried was to, to pick a constant flight speed in the room space. Um, 
which means that um, like how like how big you uh, perceive things. Um, how should I say this? You are in you like if you if you manage your, your world space flight speed, like it changes. But how how close you are to things, it's always gonna you're gonna find the same speed. Uh, and this worked pretty well for high altitudes. But as you went down to like lower altitudes, it felt like you entered this like area of mud. It was super frustrating for users to fly around. Like you you would like get stuck, and it was like very irritating. So we needed to do something about this. Um, so we, 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 we realized, like, hmm, maybe we should like, go against the device and maybe introduce some acceleration. Who knows? Um, so we came up with this power curve, uh, which basically means that in room space, we fly faster at lower scales. And then as the scale uh, gets bigger, we slowly like, uh, reduce the speed in room space. Um, and a cool trick about this was that uh, if, if you see here the, the orange curve, we thought that it, the value it converges to was a little bit too low. And we actually just switch to like a different constant speed after a certain scale. And you might think like, oh, that is probably really crazy. That's a really discontinuous acceleration. That must feel really bad. But in reality, like you try it, you fly around, like there's so much things that are happening, you're changing scale. That it's, it's not that noticeable. So I thought that was a, a cool trick that kind of just worked out. And to demonstrate, so if you remember, there was like this like glue effect earlier when you're flying low, and now we have kind of like it feels very natural, like even though like you saw the curve earlier, it's, curve earlier, it's very non-linear. Uh, as of last week, we, we launched a, a new version of Earth VR, and we have this new mode called Fixed Human Scale. So instead of scaling um, the user, always having the feet on the ground, we now have, an, now have an option to always lock the user at human scale, which means scale is one, um, which is this blue line you have here to the left. And then the question is like, okay, what do we do about flight speed now? Should we keep them at this like high flight speed? Like this was the highest room space flight speed we had before. But I think what ended up happening is for very high altitudes, you're basically like not moving at all. And it gets even worse if you fly up to the clouds. Like you can probably spend hours not getting anywhere. Like you are moving in, let's say nine meters per second, but like that doesn't really matter. Like if you compare that to a, a rocket ship or something really fast. So we needed something different. We still wanted to, we, we think it had great value that you don't fly too fast in this fixed human scale mode at low altitudes, because now uh, it really gave this like big, uh, it really gave this sense of scale. Like you really felt like, wow, the planet is huge. It actually takes me a while to get to places. So we wanted to preserve that somehow, but still make it possible like up in high altitudes to travel faster. We ended up creating three regions. One, um, the first region you see here, uh, where the blue curve stars, this is this non-linear region. So we, we slowly increase the flight speed uh, in room space, depending on the altitude. And then we have the third region, which is to the very, like, to the very far, even, even outside of this graph, where we have a linear flight speed model, which is pretty much the same as if you have this scale always changing and constant speed in room space. And then in the middle region, we blend between these two modes. The challenge here that we were struggling with, um, we had this case, like, we, we had a pretty good idea how fast it should be near the ground and how fast it should be up in the clouds. How do we make this feel very fluid so when you, like, you dive down and fly, fly downwards, how do you make it feel um, natural so you don't end up in this a new glue region where it's like, oh man, like, it's so much slower here? And I think the finding, findings were that the longer, uh, the bigger you make this transition region, uh, the less of this effect you get. So once you have all these things in place, you're flying around, it feels great, you can explore anything in the world, but it still doesn't feel like as immersive as we wanted it to. We realized we, we, need, we need a rich soundscape uh, that really sells this idea of flying. So ideally, in an ideal world, we, um, we have this location-based background sounds, like wherever you go in the world, you, like, you can just listen to the sound and you know exactly where you are. Unfortunately, this is kind of a hard problem because it turns out that the planet is very big and we didn't really, it was not really feasible for our project. So instead, we developed these uh, four location-neutral sound that can work anywhere, divided them into four different regions. So we have a ground region where it's like, things are very calm, birds are chirping in the background, then a second region, like more high up, 
almost close to the clouds, like it's very windy, it's like where the airplanes would uh, go by. And then we have the atmosphere and space layer where things are much more base, it's rumbling. And then we take the user's altitude and blend between these uh, background sounds based on the altitude. And uh, a finding we had here was it, was it worked much better uh, to take this altitude, convert it into a logarithmic space, and then blend based on that value. We have this feature in EarthVR. We, the user can point at the sun and drag it to change the time of the day. And this cost that we, for every of these um, level of sounds, we needed two versions, one day version, one night version. And then we would just blend between them depending on the, the time of the day. So for the initial launch, when all of these things were put together, um, it looked and felt and sounded like, a little bit like this. I guess there's no sound, but. Should we make sound effects ourselves? <laughs> Next up, um, now Dav is going to talk a little bit more about two of our most recent major features we added to EarthVR. Thank you, Pear. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Nadav, and I'm uh, a virtual reality engineer on Google EarthVR. Um, and so Pear and Adam talked to you guys a little bit about um, getting the basics right for Google Earth VR, so navigation and the right feel. And uh, we had this app, we released this app last year, and uh, when we gave it to the hands of our users, we noticed the first thing everyone wanted to try to do is to go to their home. Um, or in the case of uh, the Bay Area, yeah, they wanted to go to the home that they wish they could own. Um, anyways, uh, so, uh, a lot of our users uh, maybe cannot find their home directly just by flying to it. Uh, so it'd be nice if we could just give them uh, a way to type in a query or their home address and to go to that place. Uh, so we're Google, we're a search company. Uh, search should be pretty easy for us, right? Uh, well, we identified three components that we wanted to get right for search. Uh, the first one was input and UI, so figuring, letting users enter a query and easily selecting their destination. Uh, then once they select their destinations, we wanted to make sure that users know exactly where they are in space and that they selected the right place. And finally, we wanted to have a search pin that always tells them where their last search was so that if they lose their bearings while moving around, they can quickly jump back to where they were. So we started with uh, keyboard exploration, and this was actually quite challenging because at the time, there was no good keyboard solution in virtual reality. Uh, there was the Steam VR keyboard, which we actually started to use for prototyping, and it was great for us initially because we wanted to uh, quickly set up a prototype and test uh, search end-to-end. -end. Um, however, we found that uh, it, we could not use it in the final version because it was not customizable for our needs, and it was also not available on Oculus uh, SDK, which we we're planning on supporting at the time. Uh, so this is where Lullaby came in. Uh, Lullaby is an open source library for building VR and AR apps. Uh, it's developed internally at Google, and it, we use it for uh, laying out our UI, and also for providing a keyboard to the user that they can uh, use to type in a search query 
Uh, and then we also show suggestions alongside it so that you can only, uh, you only have to type in a few letters and find the destination that you're looking for. Uh, and the great thing about this keyboard was that it was both available on Oculus and Steam VR, and uh, uh, it worked pretty well for our needs. So now that the user is able to type in a query and select their destination, uh, we want to make sure that uh, when we take them to that destination, they know exactly where they are and then they know that it's the right place. Um, and the challenges here are what is the best scale, orientation, and altitude that we need to take the user to uh, to preserve their context? And uh, when teleporting to a large area like Paris, France, or Yellowstone National Park, uh, we can do uh, we can use the same solution that uh, Google Maps on desktop uses, where we teleport the user, we put the uh, uh, Earth right in front of you, and uh, we make the user scale very big so they can see the large area of Paris or another area of interest that they're looking for. However, in Earth VR, for smaller uh, search results, we wanted to place the user's uh, feet on the ground. And that can be a, a big challenge because in Earth VR, we can run into areas that have uneven and mountainous terrains, and we also have dense cities. Um, so we had to come up with a clever solution for this to uh, ensure that the user can always find where they're looking, what they're looking for. So we start with a basic scene. We have uh, a house and we have uh, some terrain around it. And the first thing that we, uh, we found out was that it's important to put the user about two meters away from the pl place they're looking at because two meters gave us a comfortable viewing distance for the uh, point of interest. Uh, and we also ensured that the user's feet are right on the ground so that they don't feel like they're intersecting with the geometry or floating up in space. Then to highlight the point of interest, we add a search pin and we ensure that the user's gaze uh, towards the search pin is uh, at 15 degrees down because that gives the, the user a comfortable uh, resting position for their eyes. Um, so now that we have the spin, what do we do when the user moves around it? So uh, again, the problem we were trying to solve with the search pin is we wanted to, uh, pe people to see exactly where their search was. And as they're moving around Earth, uh, uh, they'll be able to come back to the last search location if they've lost their bearings. So we want to keep this pin in view, regardless of scale, distance, or whether it gets uh, hidden by buildings and terrain. Uh, and we want to make sure that it's always legible and does not break immersion. Uh, to solve the problem of occlusion, um, we came up with a solution uh, where we render the pin at two passes. We render uh, the pin in a first pass with full opacity and with depth testing. And so that's what you see when the pin is not occluded by any buildings. And we also render a second pass with 50% opacity and without depth testing so that when the pin gets occluded by buildings, you can still see it, but uh, fade it out a little bit, which ensured that uh, we don't break too much immersion uh, with a behavior that you won't see in real life. Uh, so what do we do about scaling the pin when we move further away from it, or when we go up uh, in scale? So um, we, had, we begin with a naive approach of just uh, keeping a constant scale for the pin in world space. And what happens when you scale up is uh, the pin starts to uh, shrink a little bit. It's still visible in higher scales. But when we go all the way to planet scale, the pin can become very small and not legible. So we wanted to make sure that the pin is still visible and legible, uh, even at these far distances and high scales. So what we found was uh, worked pretty well is using uh, a formula that uses the, s the distance in world space between the search pin and the uh, user's head. And we multiply that by some base scale in world space uh, with the dampening so that as you go further and further away from the pin, it still scales up and it still stays in view, but it does so more slowly so it still appears like it's getting further and further away from you. Um, and this ensures that we don't break immersion, but we still keep the pin in view. Uh, and the solution also works when we scale up the viewer.
So to recap all the things that we needed for search, um, so these are the three components that we really needed to get right in virtual reality. Uh, we needed a rock solid text entry, which was not available before, uh, for users to enter a query and select their destination as fast as possible. Uh, second, we needed to take user to the desired point of interest at a comfortable distance and a viewing angle. Uh, and we needed to make sure that the pin stays always visible so that as the user is moving around, uh, they know uh, where their last search was and they can get their bearings that way. So uh, we had a launch uh, for EarthVR exactly uh, last week. Uh, and we, uh, for that launch, focused on enabling Street View, which was another one of our most requested features. Um, and we've actually been thinking about Street View for a long time. So in the summer of 2015, the Earth VR team went to see Inside Out by Pixar, and we saw the memory spheres in Inside Out, and we were really inspired to try to do something with memory spheres in virtual reality. So we came up with a prototype that uses photospheres uh, placed around Manhattan, and the users can uh, move around Manhattan, point and click at a photosphere, and put it on top of their head and view the entire full 360 photo. Uh, we found it was a very compelling uh, use case for photospheres. Uh, but we also thought that, uh, or we also at the time were focusing on getting the, the core features of navigation in EarthVR. So we had to table these ideas for later. Um, but a little bit about why Street View is important for us is because a lot of uh, cities on EarthVR do not actually have 3D data, like Tel Aviv here. Um, but the city does have Street View, and it would be awesome if the user can explore the city uh, using Street View rather than just looking at a flat satellite image. Even in cities that do have a Street View, like Paris, for example, uh, we can still get a lot, of, a lot of value from jumping in a Street View image because we can see the city at night and we can see the, the people walking around in that city. Uh, and we believe that it also provides a much more immersive and intimate experience. So the two components we identified for Street View uh, to be really good in virtual reality we're showing Street View availability, so telling the player when they will actually be able to enter a Street View panel. And secondly, we uh, uh, wanted to give users an intuitive and quick way to enter and exit uh, Street View. So we anchored our initial explorations and prototyping in the solution that's in Google Maps. So Google Maps gives you uh, coverage layers that show where Street View is available in blue. And they give you this peg man that you can just drop in a place and enter uh, the panel that's in that location. Uh, so we experimented with this in uh, Google Earth VR. And uh, we also tried to enable entering Street View using these coverage layers. Uh, but we found two non-trivial, uh, two problems with, uh, uh, with these coverage layers. And one, that it was non-trivial to overlay them on top of the Earth because the terrain is uneven, and it can look pretty odd when you get up close to, uh, to the road and you see this, uh, this blue line around it. And in places that have a lot of street view coverage, it could get pretty, uh, uh, pretty messy to render so many lines around you. Um, we're also inspired to try out the uh, pegman dropping gesture from Maps. Uh, that's all I'll say about that. <laughs> um, so we had to we had to go back to the drawing board and uh, find a better solution uh, for Street View and virtual reality. So what we found was the best experience was let's say we have a user standing around the city and they have their uh, controller with the the globe or map on their left hand. Um, and right now, Street View is not available because the user is at a high scale. So we have a, a threshold, a visualize in blue, that once the user goes below, we uh, show you uh, a, a ripple effect, notifying that Street View is available. And then we also put a, a preview uh, of your Street View uh, that's showing up right below your feet. Uh, so you can see a quick video of how this works here. 
where the user is flying down, and as they go below the threshold, we pop up a Street View preview image. And as the user flies out of the Street View, uh, we show an icon to display that it's unavailable. For entering Street View, uh, we first tried letting the user hold the bubble, point at it with their right hand, and then pull the trigger to enter. We found that that was a pretty easy way to enter and exit Street View, but our users didn't intuitively understand this gesture. What they tried to do is take the bubble and put it directly on top of their head, uh, just like the Photospheres demo that I showed you earlier. Uh, so we, listen, we listened to our user feedback, and uh, we implemented this gesture that allows the user just to quickly put Street View over their head and then to pull it out when they want to exit. Uh, to summarize, these were the two components that were really important for Street View and Earth VR. Uh, the first one, uh, notifying the, th the user that Street View is available on their left controller and showing a preview of Street View on their left hand so that they can choose whether they want to enter or just skip that uh, current Street View panel. Uh, and secondly, uh, we needed to provide the intuitive peak gesture of putting the uh, bubble on top of their head and removing it uh, so that they can do so very quickly. Uh, and thank you very much for coming to this talk and listening to us. <laughs>
um, Google files patents that are um, defensive. So we're, we're not interested in blocking other companies from using these things, which is why we're sharing this stuff and we hope that you guys can learn from it and build on it. Um, having used Google VR for a while, uh, I found it to be a really wonderful experience. Uh, I'm just wondering what you guys as the devs uh, think of the future applications for this particular product. Like, what do you want Google Earth VR to be in two years from now? It's <laughs> a very loaded question, but a great one too. Uh, uh, we have a lot of ideas. Um, we're still trying to figure out our direction as well as we go. Uh, we're always trying new things. We're always experimenting with new ways that Earth can be in VR. Right. Hi, for your um, testing process, you said you recruited people. So were they various levels of expertise as far as computer use? Yeah, uh, yeah. During the recruiting, we we would also screen for like experience with gaming and VR. You know, so we had checklists like, have you tried cardboard or Gear VR or, or DK One or you know that sort of thing. So, yeah. So that was part of our one way that we sort of were more sure about our findings. You know, um, in terms of like how how experienced people were. Great. And to just uh, springboard off that. What size of a pool for like a prototype would you find? Okay, this like this size pool gave me useful data on a prototype, mm -hmm. whether it was working or not working. Yeah, so I mean, if you've ever done a user study, like you could you could bring in like four or five people, yeah. and if they're all you know throwing off the headset or getting frustrated, you know you've done something wrong. Um, so. It, you know, sometimes we'd try things and we just immediately know we got it wrong. And then the next day we had people queued up. We would tweak stuff that night and try things out. So some iterations were much quicker. Um, and then some were much slower where everything we were trying wasn't working or it was subtle. We weren't sure where things were breaking. And for those, we ended up having to do longer term studies over months. Hey guys, cool stuff, thanks for sharing. Uh, you know, I've observed the same thing as you, which is a lot of people go view their own home or places they've lived as a first experience, and I think that's awesome. And building on that, I feel like making this experience more personal to individuals would be like a really important thing to do moving forward. And so like, I just wanna give you an idea. I do a lot of mountaineering, and I have a decade worth of my GPS tracks that I use a lot on desktop, Google VR, or Google Earth. So uh, I was just wondering, you know, are you thinking about supporting KML or GPX file formats and when? <laughs> uh, or, or, okay, here's another one. How about live location data from like, I want to see where my wife is right now. <laughs> uh, thank you. Not sure about the, is this on? Yeah. No, not sure about the last one, but I think supporting KML data, it's like have been brought up before. It's just been more of like, Priorita prioritizing things, uh, it's cool. I think in some cases, like, we thought a street view was cooler for the time being, and now we have just have to sit down and like, okay, what's next, what do we do? Uh, we're not sure, but I think it's great, great suggestions. Hi guys, yeah, thanks uh, for the talk. Um, yeah, Google Earth is uh, also for me one of the best experience, super intuitive. Uh, when I tried it uh, last year uh, with my colleagues, uh, we tried one by one and we could see, you know, with the screen, what is doing uh, the person who is in VR. Uh, so my question would be, do you have in mind to maybe make it like social directly, multi headset uh, with two or more people at the same time? I think that's a really cool idea. Um, once again, it's uh, a lot of like our, our, the base of application is, is built in native. So like we have all these great ideas. It's, we just, some things takes longer than others and we just have to kind of like rank them and like how important they are. And like, I think I've heard this idea before and it's, it sounds awesome. Like I would love to just sit in front of a computer and maybe like take whoever's in the headset to do on tours or something like that. I think it would be great. Hi, 
Um, so first off, uh, like the other people said, spectacular work. Uh, it's, it's a killer app. Everybody loves it. So uh, bravo. Um, two questions on the, um, uh, the, the uh, tunnel vision, I believe you called it, feature that you did. You said that uh, 15, enough, it was enough to give about 15% of the, of the visible pixels kind of view of the grid of the floor to let people ground themselves. Uh, some of the views you showed were kind of pre-distortion versus after. So was that uh, of the total or was there also kind of a blacking out uh, that, that was also being done? Oh yeah, in the examples I showed, I, did, I blacked out to simulate more what it looks like when you're okay. looking. In the other screenshots or screen recordings, they were from the, the view that's shown on Windows. Okay. And that doesn't have any blackout. So it looks like a lot more. But when you're looking through, you're actually only seeing this little trim. Okay. And that, so, but effectively, that's the end, the end result that you were simulating. Yeah. Right. yeah. Okay. And, and then the, the uh, second question was with regards to the... Uh, you know, all of the controller schemes you showed were using the Vive controller and you talked about wanting to support Oculus. There's a mm -hmm. ton of people working on other controllers and gloves and all kinds of stuff. Have you thought about, uh, are you gonna support these one at a time or have you thought about making it kind of, uh, taking your set of functions and then providing a way for people to map them to other controllers you haven't thought of? Yeah, we, I mean, we, we could provide a, a mapping file that people could do, but like to get the, you know, to make it intuitive for people to just grab a controller and look down and see tool tips and all this stuff, we have to do custom work for each one. Um, like just doing Oculus was pretty different. We had to rethink how things were mapped. We even had to tweak the controller model a little bit to make it more intuitive. Um, so we, we'd like to support everything, but it, uh, we're just currently just on track to support the, the major ones that people are using. Okay, thanks. Yeah, um, just one more thing about the, the tunnel vision size. Uh, the, the size we picked was a little bit larger than what we actually needed, and that's because when people have glasses in the headset, or with some headsets, you could push the screen a little further away from your eyes. So when you had it at that max setting, you couldn't see it. But if we, you know, in the future, potentially we can control that a little bit better, or maybe even know what setting that's at, we could even reduce tunnel vision quite a bit more. So, um, yeah. Hi, thanks for the great sharing. So, uh, Google released the AR core a few weeks ago. So, I'm wondering if you are currently designing the UX for the AR or mixed reality. If not, so what are the main challenges or problems you are anticipating? regarding to designing for that part? Uh, it's something that we would like to do. Uh, we have experiments where we've, we've brought Earth into Unity and tried things like this out, so it's not um, particularly difficult, but so it's something that we're really interested in. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Cool, thank you very much for coming. <laughs>